Welcome to the 28th episode of the Decentralized Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner Lytle, here with your other host, Wyatt Carson. We're also joined by friend of the pod and returning guest, John Grange. Hey guys, nice to be here again. Yes, thank you so much for coming back on. You're our very first repeat guest. Wow. That's cool. I, I appreciate the distinction. So we're really excited to have you on. We've been talking about AI quite a bit, and it's actually been performing by far the best. I mean, we're talking, what, six, seven times viewership um, in terms of mm -hmm. downloads and video views and things like that. So there's definitely a need as well as just in my daily life. It feels like every conversation devolves into <laughs> this AI stuff because it's it's on everyone's minds. So really excited to get your perspective as someone who's been like a tech founder who is now in the VC space, but more importantly, just living that technical end because you got Wyatt on the business process side. You got me more on like the, you know, I don't know, the day-to-day -day entrepreneurial, but as well as art and all those things. And neither of us are technical people. So I'd love to hear your take on what's been going on in that world right now. Sure. Well, you know, I think the reason why it kind of comes up in everybody's day to day discussions right now is that there is in, you know, kind of today's world of like a 24 by seven news cycle and things, you know, news travels fast. There's always something to talk about these different AI projects, particularly around the large language model, the GPT, um, open AI's uh, GPT, you know, three and four models. There's just so many new things coming out like every week that there's just always something new to, to talk about. And then the other side of that is, is the way these models are kind of constructed and trained, um, et cetera, means that even to the people that have built them, they're somewhat black box. Like OpenAI has made some capabilities that um, do really cool things. Like they can essentially predict model capabilities before they've trained it and done everything with it. All that's really cool. But at the end of the day, there are all these there's a lot to be discovered when one of these is released. And I don't think, I think that's a very new concept in software. Like there's not, um, it actually is more like a video game, like when open world gaming kind of started to become big and there would, a game would become kind of virally popular. And a lot of it was like discovery. People would be posting what they discovered. And this kind of takes that to like a whole nother level. So I just think there's always something new to talk about for everybody. I've compared it to, I was, a, I had a game store, of course, and Magic the Gathering is a, big part of that and every new set there would be this big discovery of learning like what how do you using these new cards and these new things how do you develop the best strategies how do you actually kind of learn the language of this new tech you know this new system and then there's no meta defined so there's no like best practices or doing things it's just pure exploration and it's such a fun time before they figure it out and i'm getting that same feeling right now with these ai tools because it's not we don't understand how to best interact with them, prompt them and how to get the best outputs out of them yet. It's not at this like, you know, stage where it's all just kind of fig solved. Everything's so new. And then like you're saying too, it's, it's iterating so unbelievably quickly that it feels like every week there's just new players in the market, whether it be through Microsoft or through Google or AWS jump or Amazon jumping in all these different people. And you, yeah, it's just, you're, it's like you're trying to solve everything or you're trying to figure it out. And it's so exciting. I love it. Well, like even like use cases aside, think about kind of, you know, like crypto, for instance, um, from an accessibility standpoint, if you were kind of like getting really into crypto and you started to kind of read about it, you're seeing a lot about it online. It, you still had to learn a lot of very kind of esoteric stuff. And when you look at something like um, AI and large language models, something like chat GPT, like prompts are natural language. Like you don't have to learn an API or an API call. In fact, I was just at like a little kind of mixer last night and everybody, of course, there's a circle of people talking about chat GPT. Almost nobody even has access to like the GPT-4 API. Um, people are typing prompts in and they're learning about prompting. It's very, it's like maybe one of the most accessible like technologies that, that I've, I've ever seen, like deep technologies where, um, there's really kind of something for for everyone, regardless of like your technical acumen. Um, and particularly when you start to look at things like um, not just generating um, um, text and, and other natural language, but generating things like art and visuals and things like that. I just think that there's an accessibility here that is sort of beyond like what we've seen before. 
that's probably a, a good <clears throat> reason. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. And 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 my my mom in her 60s, bless her heart, decided to go back to college. And I was telling her about Chat GPT. I was like, well, you know, you could do this. You could look. At it it can replace Google. All these things. And she's she's like, oh no, I'm not. You know, that technology is it's too much for me. <clears throat> but it but it's not just the open AI chat GPT website, anyone can go in there, type in a few strings of text, like you're talking to another person and discover a whole new world that is, that is unheard of. And that's the exciting part. And to your point, there's, there's entire jobs and careers popping up suddenly, you know, chat GPT is not very old, but there are already prompt engineering roles and learnings and trainings out there. And it's creating entirely new career paths, let alone, uh, <clears throat> the, the accessibility, you know, hundred million users in two months, that adoption rate is, is mind boggling when you, when you consider it, it's only going to get better. With the prompt engineering piece of it, going back to kind of my comment I made about these models or even like black box to the people that build them in many, many respects, like there's a lot of prompt engineering that's still to be discovered. Like, it's not like, it's not like SQL where there's a, you can go out and read the documentation on exactly what SQL is. And then you read that and then you go and you learn how to write your SQL queries. And there's like a right way to write SQL queries. Like prompt engineering, I feel is so much more open-ended and there's, it's become a thing because the, these, these AI platforms have become a thing. But I think, I, I don't think that even like the best the people that have spent the, the most, you know, the thousands of hours um, researching prompts and doing prompt engineering, I suspect that like, there's still a lot more to be discovered about the best ways to sort of interact with these models. And that's like very exciting to me. To keep on the subject of accessibility too, MIT just did a study that they published where they took about 500 white collar employees and they split half into a group where they were given chat GPT with no training and then a half with just no chat GPT at all. And the, the group with chat GPT was able to complete tasks 37% faster. It's just the amount of productivity that you get with no training is absolutely insane. But the, the most interesting part I found too was the people who used it, especially when they had to had them start iterating on different versions of the work that they did, fell in love with it. And they said that they would be willing to spend on average a half of percentage point of their annual salary for this technology, which this most, I think the average salary was around $100,000, which is like 500 bucks a month that they'd be willing to pay for this tool for the first time they used it. That's the amount of like value that it's providing to them. It's insane. I suspect that that study will end up being referenced in many uh, VC slide decks. Oh, 100%. So much. So much. <laughs> and, and not only, and that's just prompts. That's just you know Joe Normal getting on there and typing some stuff like they're talking to a computer what we want to start getting into though and discussing is the capabilities outside of just going to the website and putting in prompts. We're talking APIs, you know, if you can get access to GPT four API or something like that, the possibilities then become exponential. You know, I'm seeing an other Twitter threads, some what I would call naysayers say things like we're reaching the end of chat GPT's capabilities. You know, we, we, we've been playing with it for a couple of months and we're reaching the end. And I think that is, grossly uh, misstated, honestly, because the API changes things, changes the game. It goes from simple, any, any person can use it to now people with more technical understanding and details can create bots and start creating some amazing products out there that we, we couldn't even consider a year ago, right? It's also incredibly arrogant. Um, Ooh, yeah. It's, it just, it just absolutely is. I mean, it's a model that's probably, you know, we don't know for sure now, unfortunately, but it's like a trillion parameters, maybe. Um, numbers are huge. Humans don't have a great track record of doing well with like large numbers. Like that's a ton. That's a huge model. Um, but the other thing about it is kind of just the software development aspect of it. All that we we're talking about kind of all this very nascent accessibility and these kind of natural language aspects of interacting with it that are very novel in technology. But kind of, there are some very classic issues here, which is when you're building apps, stuff doesn't happen overnight. So like AutoGPT is a good example where AutoGPT is essentially a, an agent, an AI agent that sort of automates using um, GPT to accomplish tasks based off of goals and other inputs that you give it. Um, AutoGPT, 
I, I've seen a lot of people with these big hot takes online about, oh, auto GPT is just, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just, you get stuck in loops. It's been out for two weeks. It's been out for two weeks. Like anybody that knows anything about software knows that like, that's not just a model that's trained up with like a, a user input form and like you go, like this is like a piece of software that's built on top of, um, that's using the API, the, the open AI API, you put in your API key to go. Um, if you go to their GitHub and you look at their issues, it's almost all classic issues you find with a software package, compatibility, getting it set up, different like dependency issues. Like, you know, like I look at, I look at things like auto GP, auto GPT and I'm like, yes, I've, I've played with it a lot. Like. I've definitely gotten stuck in like Google loops because Google Googling for stuff is one of only like three functions it has. But like you can totally see that once the team works through a lot of these kind of classic issues with, you know, users having issues like setting it up because of this or that dependency, different bugs, and they start adding more functions and polish and things like that. There's some real like it's very it's incredibly promising. And I just think that having a hot take about a piece of software like a weekend is incredibly arrogant. Can you provide a couple of use cases of what auto GPT could be used for to kind of explain to somebody, you know, like what it is and then how it could be applied into software or day-to-day -day life? Yeah. So, um, right now it's got, it's, it's, um, you know, like I said, it's an agent that is able to, um, accomplish tasks for you. And to accomplish those tasks, it interfaces with um, OpenAI's GPT, th you know, three, five, or four, depending on your API key. Um, and then it has these functions where it can do things like introspect files. Um, it can go out and Google stuff for you. Um, there's like one or two other things I can't remember right now. I don't even have my second monitor to have it up. So anyway, I wanted to focus on the conversation. But uh, the idea is that you give it a goal. Um, and right now I would say like one of the best thing, one of the things it's best at is like being like a research assistant. Like I want to find out, you know, this thing and it will go develop its own set of tasks to undertake that effort. And so it's basically like, if you think about it, it's like it, they, they set it up for you as if you're building your own AI. So like in me playing around with it, my, my current company, I'm co-founder and CTO of Ops Compass. Ops Compass is a, a SaaS platform that provides our customers with like ri risk analysis, visibility, and such from like the perspective of security compliance, software asset management. So we have a product and we have this roadmap. I was like, I kind of want to make like a, an AI that's like a product manager. Cause we always have like, that's always tough when you have kind of a broad platform, like your roadmap and like, kind of like who owns things and what do you build? And so I, you, you, when you set up auto GPT, it kind of says, what kind of AI do you want to build? And you literally give it a description of kind of what you want it to do. And it's on the backside interacting with like GPT-4. So it's almost like if you think about like a brain, it's almost like the cortical system, like re like reasoning. They're using the language models to provide kind of like reasoning and natural language processing to ask you questions back. And then it basically like before it does anything, since it costs you money to hit that API, it asks you if you want it to do it. But essentially it just starts to like ask you, it comes up with things that it thinks it should do. And then you say, yeah, go do that. So it'll start researching kind of Ops Compass's market and it'll re ask about other companies. And then it'll say, do you want me to, you know, I think we need to create a first kind of roadmap and it'll actually generate it. So there's like a little file space on your local system. That's like, it, it's kind of weird. Um, it's very futuristic feeling because it creates a workspace for the both of you. Um, so it'll start to like generate like files and like drop it in that workspace. Um, going back to some of the stuff we talked about, about generating kind of visuals, it will actually generate, um, you know, a product diagram. Um, so this stuff is like, it's very, very cool. Um, what, one of the other aspects of it that I think is interesting is that it introduces um, essentially long-term memory. Um, it uses like a vector database to um, maintain a longer kind of memory. Like I said, if it, or if you will, of um, the prompts and what it's doing. So it, it kind of takes this idea of a neural network that started a lot, all this, and which was very loosely based on, on the brain, the human brain, and kind of adds some other aspects that again, are very loosely based on the human brain. Like it's great to have like a reasoning capability to be able to understand language, but you kind of also need to be able to have like a, a long-term-ish memory. 
um, to be effective doing things. Um, so that's essentially how AutoGPT and the other agent type systems work. Um, so yeah, very, very, very cool. Very much automating a lot of the stuff that you would kind of do sitting in the chat GPT window um, on a project and trying to make it smarter and kind of, um, again, more of like an AI assistant that, that you get to really like uh, tune and teach yourself. It kind of creates a, a your own your own AI model. I wonder if we could uh, create a uh, podcast co-host in auto GPT, just in case one of us gets sick, Wyatt. That would be awesome. So from a VC standpoint with chat GPT, with the APIs, with auto GPT, are you starting to see already a, a, a large amount of products being created a lot, uh, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, software or anything created with this? Are you starting to see that already? Or are they in the works? Have, where are you hearing the buzz from, from the entrepreneurial world? Uh, definitely a lot of, uh, you know, with the large language model stuff, um, it's, it's a lot of people with existing products that are now seeing like ways that they could really kind of turbocharge, augment, uh, et cetera, their, their current offering. You're starting to see some other things that are built, you know, uh, just specifically around it. But a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, you know, the AI software that you see today is still, um, it's derivative of a lot of the technology that's a part of these large language models. So like a big part of, uh, uh, generative pre-trained transformers, which is what GPT stands for, is convolutional neural networks. And without getting into the particulars, convolutional neural networks are really, really, were really instrumental in computer vision. And like just in our, our move venture capital portfolio, we've made around eight investments so far. And two or three, three of them maybe are in, three of them are, are AI oriented. And like two of those are, are heavy on computer vision. Um, but almost everybody is is now like exploring ways that like, hey, like what can we do? What can we do with these like large language models? The other thing is, is almost all of these startups are using um, like Copilot, GitHub's Copilot. So even in places where the people aren't building explicit products around um, like a GPT model, they're they're actively using it to sort of turbocharge their product development process. But I. I expect almost every product to be featuring some aspect of it. Like even at Ops Compass, like um, when you think, like I, like I talked about, we have it's a product where we're really assessing people's environments and their configurations for are they configured okay, and um, is there a, a security vulnerability? Is there something that's causing you to pay too much? Like all this stuff, we end up having a lot of screens that are very dense in data, and there's no way around it. There's no like slick UX way around it. But what's very interesting with something like um, uh, chat GPT and uh, GPT-4 in general is it gives us a way now to have some interesting capabilities in terms of explaining to customers what they're seeing, explaining to users what they're seeing. And I think that's going to be actually a really powerful thing in UI because um, there's only so much you can do with flow and tool tips and whatever. I think having like really smart, um, you know, modals and things and software screens that are able to summarize dense data and things like that is like very powerful. And I expect to see a lot more of that in software too. Yeah. You could have very context specific UIs. So it will dynamically generate the interface based off of the information needing to be known as well as what that information is. Uh, I have a question for you here. So what do you think the risks are for somebody who either is wanting to start a company using some of these like LLM platforms, or maybe wants to pivot and really integrate a lot of these into their existing business? Because I'll give you an example of what happened recently. There's um, a company called Linktree that you might see on like social media a lot of times where uh, main social media platforms like Twitter or Instagram won't let you post links in your bio. So if you have like a web store or different things like that, you can't, um, you know, post multiple things. You can post one. Well, Instagram just recently expanded to where you can post five instead of one. And it just like plummeted the value of Linktree <laughs> um, significantly off of these things. And I know there's other applications, but most people were using it just for that expansion. I worry a little bit since you don't actually control the the LLM itself it's an you get it from OpenAI or you get it from Amazon or Google whoever you know platform you choose 
how much risk is there to build your business on top of that utilizing those tools because you don't actually control them? Yeah, really good question. I mean, I think one of the risks is that, so if you look at the landscape of things that are being built on top of it now, it's actually really cool. You've got your, and you can kind of like squint and see the future of like this whole ecosystem of software that leverages this, where you've got your open AI API key. It's almost like your auth token, but it works with all these different pieces of software. And when people are building on top of these models, they're not absorbing the cost of the API calls. They basically, as a user, you basically kind of like set it up, like log in, pop your API key in, and then the software works. And then you um, absorb, you pay for that through your um, pay as you go bill with OpenAI. So like one of the risks there is that your software all of a sudden could just cost like way more for your users. And, you know, you have like zero control over that. So I think that that's that's uh, that's definitely a risk. Um, uh, the other thing is, that I would say though is, and I've posted a number of these like papers and things on Twitter. But when you look at the research space, there are a lot of people that are building their own models using transformers and be using that architecture. And I just posted one on my Twitter the other day called I think it was out of University of Texas. It's called Cancer GPT. But they basically created a 125 million parameter LLM that was trained on essentially like tabular data about different tissues. And they're looking, they're basically doing drug pair uh, efficacy prediction. But long story short, their 125 parameter model outperformed GPT-3, um, which is billions of parameters. Um, like I think, I think that version of GPT-3 was like over 100 billion parameters. Um, outperformed it on a number of different cancer tissues. Now, I just imagine like how that work would, you know, like that was just their first cut. It's really the first kind of work of its kind. But I also think that you'll start to see that uh, it will make sense and it will work really well for companies, startups to be rolling out their own models that perform, that perform for what they're trying to do in a better way than what they're able to do off of the kind of mainline, um, like a open AI, uh, GPT models. Yeah. I think, I think you both are hitting on a, something really important that people who want to begin creating with this in their, in the background need to be really careful of, you know, you're paying by the token or whatever the situation is. Um, you're, you're spot on. I think if, and, and like, it could be a testament to a great product you built, but those, those, those costs can skyrocket exponentially. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people might be prepared for. Um, now, obviously I don't think Tanner and I could do it, but, and, and we don't need great detail. How difficult is it for someone to build their own, um, and, and be able to control that is, is, I mean, obviously this, this hospital or, or whatever created it, but to me, that seems, wow, impossible, but is is that kind of technology just rapidly available where people are able to create this, their own now? Their, their own? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a place where you'll see, you know, we talked about VC earlier. I mean, I think that the, to the extent you'll see applications that are um, really leveraging a lot of this technology, not just as sort of a, an accoutrement, um, but as kind of like a main focus. Like this research for Cancer GPT came out of Texas, it was funded. So I think startups in the same way there's just software that would really be really hard for just one person to build, you know, in their bedroom in a, in a few weeks. Uh, the big thing is, is you just, you have to train it. You have to have the hardware to do it. And the just going through and building the data set is really hard. The cancer GPT was really interesting because it leveraged this project that was made that takes, uh, this is another thing I think is interesting about language models. You'd say, well, drug prediction, like all the numbers that are involved in tissue samples, and drug pair efficacy. Well, how does a language model deal with that? And like, there's a there's a package that somebody built that takes tabular data, serializes it into a string of natural language text, and then you can wrap it in prompts. And amazingly, these transformer models do a great job at at essentially being trained on that corpus of text, even though we would think of that tabular data as, as numbers. So, um, and it's, and again, I, I think if you look at the data, I just, you always have to look at things like with an eye for the future here, because most of these things are very, it's like the first cut of most of these things. So I look at it and I'm like, man, this thing, 
this 125 million parameter model is like outperforming it way outperforms gpt2 so like it generalizes way better so i just look at the jump from two to three in some cases this way this much smaller model performs better than three and nobody's done anything with the latest stuff with four and working that and so i just think there's there is uh so many places to go. You mentioned something earlier a little bit about when we were talking about paying by the token and some of the risks there. I think there's a lot of education to be had, even like what is a token? Because, you know, like the word like the word freedom is like two tokens. Uh, yep. Part of the reasons why <laughs> these models have gotten so good is that they fine grained the tokenization of all these things. And uh, it ends up being really hard to figure out what's actually going on. I was amazed. I spent a weekend playing with AutoGPT and I spent like less than a dollar. And I just felt like it was like API call city, man. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to like get some huge bill on this thing. But it's very, again, large numbers. Like it's it's hard to kind of in your head have a good feel for what's going on here. And like we're t- sitting here casually talking about models that have, uh, it's only 125 million parameters. 125 million of anything is a lot. It's very hard to like wrap your head around. And now when we're talking about the latest stuff is like a trillion. Like what does that even mean? I wonder too, this is probably more in Wyatt's territory, but when they were first creating these large language models, they just gobbled up everything. So not only is there a lot of duplicates, there's just a lot of useless information. So if they can really optimize lean, even use a lot of these AI tools to parse out what's useless in there, you could have a very, very tight data set that could do way more applications than some of these large, you know, just gobbled up everything databases. Yeah, I, I definitely think that we're seeing that, like, I don't think that, like, the next phase of this is, oh, it's going to be a two trillion parameter model. I think there, the next phase of this, I think there's probably got to be some innovation on the hardware side. I think there's been a lot of focus on software and a lot of innovation on software. Um, uh, John Carmack, famously the creator of Doom, kind of one of my one of my idols, one of my, like, non-sports, like, idols that I just think is, like, I get, like, really dorky if I ever like met him in person. Like he's he's kind of gone from, you know, building Doom and stuff, like that's what he's known for. But he went and kind of took his his fortune and he started building rockets and stuff. Um and then he went to um uh Google Meta and built virtual reality. And again, the reason why they wanted him is think about building Doom and Castle Wolfenstein and those, he really had to understand at the lowest level how graphics worked and how to draw essentially like triangles in incredibly powerful ways on screen. And that's why he was great in VR, right? How do you push graphics? How do you push systems to the limit to render these screens? Well, I he's now, he's left meta and he's focusing all of his efforts on um, uh, like AGI, creating AGI. And what I think is interesting about that is nobody's focusing on hardware. And what I love about John Carmack is like, he's a software developer, but he is going to, I, I think he's going to like have a lot of insights and innovate kind of at that hardware, like machine level that I think is very much needed now. Cause for the last like 10 years, it's just been a lot of software innovation, a lot, you know, that goes along with, you know, new faster GPUs are coming out, but it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, TensorFlow and Keras. And like, if you think about it, all these things were software abstractions that made these capabilities more accessible to developers. And I just think that we'll have better, now that we've found like these transformer models, we understand their capabilities better. We'll see these more purpose-built transformer models that are maybe smaller parameters. And I'm hoping that we see a lot of kind of machine level innovation that allows us to sort of turbocharge what we're doing as we get into like these new like GPT-5 and 6 and you know, whatever else, it'll probably end up being something else that's transformer based. To explain to the audience too, how this stuff works right now is it has been just gobble up as much information as possible, but they also on the hardware side, they use um, GPUs. So graphical units, the what were developed originally for things like gaming or 3d rendering for video. And like, if you were making an animated movie through Pixar, they used a lot of these GPUs and stuff to process those things. And they found that they're really good for processing this type of information through the matrices and transformers like you're talking about. So at the current time, they're basically just buying up lots and lots of GPUs and expanding their hardware to give them more energy uh, processing capability to just 
deal with these larger and larger models. But I think you're right where similar to the old ways they used to design CPUs where they just added in more and more transistors and just kind of doubled up on itself over and over, they're going to find new innovative ways to make it more lean, more efficient, um, require less energy because the amount of energy it takes to process this stuff is is incredibly expensive. Uh, so yeah, I think you're on the right track there and what the next leaps are really going to be. Speaking of <clears throat> the, the near future, um, I'd like to transition and get your thoughts on, on where this is going in terms of regulation and just, just your opinions, you know, no one can see the future, but you know, I, I was reading an article about how they gave 40 members of Congress access to jet chat GPT, let them play with it, learn about it. Um, and you're seeing a lot of concerns in the business world about privacy and, you know, going to the open source and, and PII and all that good stuff. Where do you see this going in terms of regulation soon? Because we're dealing with with privacy concerns. And, and this is probably one of the biggest factors right now from it just spreading like wildfire across the business world is a lot of concerns. I, I'm, I'm aware of many businesses right now that have a moratorium on it. Don't touch it. Do not bring it in our system. Don't even try it. Um, where do you see this going in the near future with privacy and regulation? Um, I think that from a from like a privacy perspective, and there's a very re there's a recent release of uh, ChatGPT. It's just like a couple of days old, where there's now capabilities built in for you to just um, essentially ensure that none of your inputs end up being saved in their kind of corpus of information. Um, I think that there will end up probably being um, layers that are built uh, by B two B software companies to interact with these models. So, you know, it always sucks to be in a big company. So you're not going to be able to just use like a little login to OpenAI, but you'll probably have some enterprisey platform. Um, I may even build one. I don't know. I was going to say, sounds like an opportunity to me. <laughs> that's always the type of stuff I end up building is like the most boring stuff and whatever the technology kind of revolution is of the of the time. But you know, you you log into some enterprise software that's a layer between you and the large language model that you're interacting with that imposes some sort of guardrails on what you're able to input into it. Um, I kind of think that part of it's pretty easy. Um, I also think that these things are so black box that it's just like, I don't know, like um, I think to some extent it gets like pretty hard to at a very deep level um, kind of granularly have like the privacy I think that we're that we're used to or at least the the transparency we're used to. I think from a regulatory perspective, the bigger thing is, and we're starting to see some of it come up, which is this these the large amounts of data that these models are trained on is often just stuff off the internet. And if you're going to go train a model on a bunch of stuff off the internet, you're going to go sell it. What about the owners of the internet content that was used in training? Like how do they, so I think Stack Overflow has basically come out and said like, we're not going to let open AI, like, you know, essentially like use Stack Overflow data, which was, I believe a part of, um, the, the training data set for the GPT models. I think that's going to be kind of interesting. I don't know where it's going to go, but I think it's very valid. And uh, my guess is something will happen with the web um, that will make it, that will make some kind of gates and things so that you can, just like you can build a website and you can tell, you can put a page up on your website and tell Google not to crawl it. You'll probably end up being able to put a, have some HTML flag or something that makes it so that somebody can't scrape it for a, or at least easily scrape it for a, um, a, like a data set for like a large language model. But I don't know. I think that the copyright stuff is like way, way more. I mean, Tanner knows, Tanner probably knows more about this than I do, but the stuff going on on like the generative like visuals, like, I don't know how that's going to go down. I mean, that's, that's a very kind of gnarly mess that I think it'll totally upend kind of every, the way we've done you know, who owns somebody's like, how somebody looks. Um, you can always just generate a new thing that like looks just like a little bit different. I don't know how that's going to end up being, you know, regulated at all. There's definitely a lot of things in flux with that. I have some peers in the artist community that are, have a lawsuit with stable diffusion right now because they blatantly took their work, put it into their data sets and, and users and their 
their products can say, I want this in the style of that artist. And it clearly <laughs> used their, their art in referencing that. So yeah, it's going to be a weird idea or weird world going into it where what, what does copyright actually do? Maybe that needs to evolve substantially and maybe how can our government and, you know, legislation really adapt to those, these changes because it is happening so unbelievably quickly. And, and these companies are still in that Hoover mode of just sucking up everything and just, you know, what is it? Facebook's quote, like move fast and break things. I think AI has taken that to a whole nother level. And I guess on that spirit too, I would like to get your perspective of what are some of the potential like implications to these, you know, the disruptions that these tools are getting. And there's a lot of, you know, stuff in the news. What is just hype in your opinion? That's not actually going to happen. Um, you know, what's overblown, but what is in your opinion, some of the realities of where we're headed? I think that uh, there's a lot of actually like very real risks that have a uh, substantial societal downside. But I think that most of those risks are kind of like too boring for people to write articles about them and post them on Twitter. I think that, you know, like a, the idea of like a singularity, I just don't think is like a re even a reasonable idea, the way that these things get built. It's so incremental over time. And it's so, there's so many people involved. And like, also, even when an incremental change happens, it actually takes a while for that change to be fully kind of absorbed into kind of the world of technology, just like auto GPT, big innovation, but it's actually just as a piece of software, it's in its very early days. So it can't even today have the impact that it potentially could. So how do you measure? So this idea that there's just going to be, somebody's just going to be like training a model like one day, and then all of a sudden it's like this singularity moment and it's like all over. And, uh, you know, this AGI wants to turn us all into paper clips, uh, reference to Nick Bostrom's uh, super intelligence book. I think it was called super intelligence. Do you want to explain that story really quick? It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of a, a thought experiment about how a, a, an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, a sufficiently smart one, a super intelligent general intelligence. Um, if it had a utility function, if you screw up like what its utility function is, so what its sort of uh, goals are, and you said, you know, you wanted it to like create paper clips. It would turn all of like the mass on earth and then beyond into just paper clips. And so it's meant to characterize the danger of kind of playing with the technology that we don't understand and things like that. Um, it's an interesting concept, interesting book. Um, but I just think that the way that these things are likely to happen is I do think we'll get to uh, we'll have systems that are far, far more intelligent by like any measure than what we have now over the next few. I mean, just look at GPT three to four. Even if you say that, look, it's not, you're going to get diminishing returns on each one. Like GPT, like five and six, for instance, are, are very likely to be like much more impressive. And I just think that we haven't even fully reckoned with the impact of like the current technology into into the world because it's so new. Like, it's crazy. We talk about this stuff like it's been around for years and it is what it is. It's like, it's not even been adopted hardly yet. We have a hundred million users, but like we haven't even absorbed it in. So I think that the real risks have more to do with when, when that technology really starts to get adopted on a large scale to do real things. I think that the, the, the economic um, disruptions um, I think that there's a lot of productivity to be gained out of it, but I don't know if we've really built a society around um, productivity being gained that way. Um, I mean, we still we still count we still calculate GDP kind of like we're a society that primarily like counts bars of iron and and you know like some amount of wheat and you know whatever. Like, I just think that we just have a whole world that's built around. We don't even have a, we haven't even really built a lot of our institutions around the world as it exists today and five years ago, let alone what could happen very, very realistically if we just adopt like GPT-4 capabilities ubiquitously and in a major way across um, like global economies. So like that's where to me the risks just end up being like everybody kind of goes crazy because generative stuff 
you know, deep fakes. Um, you start to have real problems in the in democracies with elections because you can now just you already had like have like disinformation issues because of the internet. Well, now it can just be completely turbocharged. Um, it is a very real thing about like there's a lot of jobs like very entry level like junior jobs and there's definitely something to be said about uh, like ChatGPT can take a, a junior developer and make them a lot better. But like I just think that it's it would be pretty naive to say that like, like zero people are going to be, are going to zero positions are going to be lost by technology like this. And it's all just going to be additive from like an employment perspective. I don't think it's like, nobody's going to need a job ever again, but I think it's like very disruptive. So I think almost all of the real risks are related to more kind of upending how society works in ways like that are much more dramatic than like the printing press and much more dramatic than like the steam engine and the internet even um just because again like it's the i, I saw somebody say that look the chat gpt isn't like having like a, a super intelligent assistant but it's like having ten thousand kind of dumb but but somewhat useful assistants and like there's something to be said about that's pretty powerful uh so you can like do a lot with that so like I mean, an army I of middle schoolers. Yeah, I also think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do it. It's like, would you rather fight? Like, what is it? Like, would you rather fight like one uh, gorilla or like a hundred chickens or something? Like, there's yeah, it was like a one like, yeah, some... one duck sized horse or a thousand or like a hundred uh, horse sized ducks. I think it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. But I mean, if you think at like AGI, what it's very likely to be is, I do think that, by the way, I think that these like uh, transformer based large language models are, are probably the first thing that I've seen that are very, I think that it's very likely that it's a core component of what AGI ends up being. But just like our brain has a number of systems, it's kind of like what we have now is almost like a cortex, but we have no like limbic system. We have no, you know, I, I think that we've, What's interesting about this is there's probably a piece now that I could see. It's like, okay, like this could be it, but I just don't think that there's going to be like a singularity moment where it's just like after this one day, this discovery was made. And then after that, everything's screwed. Like that's not going to happen. And to explain to the audience too. Um, so there's different types of AI. We're at this stage right now. It's called linear AI. It's very like purpose driven. So this, they're using these large language models are basically just doing very simple tasks and we're getting really neat results from that. And then there's AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. And this is kind of the goal of open AI and a lot of these companies. And how they define that is, is a, the AI itself is capable of doing equal to or better than a human in all tasks, basically. And then there's something on top of that that's called ASI, which is artificial super intelligence, which it can do they can do far better, exponentially better than humans or the human race in, in there. And so the concept of singularity where it becomes somewhat uh, conscious of itself, there's the issues of alignment because even um, if it's not conscious, is it going to be doing things in alignment with humans or is it just going to turn us all into paper clips? And we're really finding the impacts already on these linear AIs that are, like you said, relatively dumb we're finding huge disruptions into our society. We're into our business and our day-to-day -day lives. And we really had a test over the last, I don't know, six, seven years, which was social media. We took very, very simple um, algorithms for like recommendation engines for YouTube. And we're starting to see all these implications in child development, social discourse, political things, misinformation, just from people getting fed what video to watch next just going down the rabbit holes and potentially getting radicalized. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I think what a lot of people don't understand too, is that like, um, cause we spend a lot of time comparing these things to like humans. So one, I think that we're very, uh, chauvinistic. Like I, when I hear people talk about the, the misgivings or things that these models mess up on, I'm like, man, have you ever talked to like a human though? Um, there's that, but also, these like a a cert, like a, a transistor on a chip is like a million times faster than our bio biochemical synapses in our brain. So the time scales at which we think and do things are radically different 
So I, I also just think that we constantly um, underestimate, like, yeah, it can definitely, like, it can definitely be dumber, but like, even, even somebody who's maybe not as smart as you, if they could do in, you know, a couple of days, what it would take you 10,000 years to do, um, that's, that's like a different ball game. So again, we get back to like large numbers and scale. And sometimes I think it's hard for us as a society to wrap our collective uh, kind of heads around that. Well, guys, we are approaching the end of our time here. Uh, Tanner, final questions for John. For somebody wanting to use this tool today, and I'll, I'll put it in the context of starting a business because I know you're, you're big into that with the Nebraska Startup Academy and the Move Venture Fund. What are the preliminary steps that they should take to start learning about these systems and to start incorporating that into their idea so they could potentially build a product or a business around that that can leverage the tools to be much more successful, much more quickly and potentially much more competitive? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's I, I one, I would almost just say I wouldn't look at it too much different than how you would have looked at it a year and a half or two years ago before all this happened. Um, finding a, a problem, um, thinking of a way to solve it. What this, what I think a lot of these tools do though, is it brings in a new sort of vector by which you can go about solving this problem and a new path for you to go down. So if you've had an idea and you've been thinking about building a product, like, um, you know, like, so no code solutions, for instance, no code, was has been a great way in the last few years for founders, particularly ones that are maybe less technical or don't have like the software development background to be able to get prototypes, get MVPs built, maybe get some initial funding. I think um, focusing on the problem you solve and making something useful for people is the main thing. But now you have the ability to say, hey, with these powerful tools, like what can that do for me solving this problem now? And also, if you don't know how to code, like these are great assistants to like, help you either learn to code or even write a lot of the code for you. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think as much about, unless you're already kind of deep in the space, you kind of understand the problem sets of people building on AI. I would actually just really focus on solving problems that people have and, and then um, looking at how these new platforms can help you um, make, make some of this intelligence really part of your solution. And, one of the best ways to do it is to actually use chat GPT. A great way to learn about these is have chat GPT teach you. Chat GPT is awesome at teaching you about transformer models and the history of chat GPT itself and how to write code in any number of ways. It's very powerful. So I wouldn't get too lost in, oh my gosh, this stuff is the next big thing. I, I need to, I've always wanted to start a company. I need to hurry up and go build like a language model. I would mostly proceed down the path that you would have a couple of years ago. I would just now include these tools in kind of in the space of of kind of capabilities that i was thinking about using to build build out my idea well john once again uh our first reoccurring guest on this podcast um we greatly appreciate you coming on this is obviously a topic tanner and i are deeply ingrained in and and invested in and it's great to talk to someone with your background both from uh the the, the entrepreneurial vc side and also technology and development side so it, it's been great to have a, a third person in the room to bounce these ideas off because tanner and i are just texting all day like hey check out this article oh this is what nvidia did so it, uh, thank you very much for coming on again with us today and uh who knows, maybe in six months when something happened in the AI sphere that none of us could predict, we'll bring you back on and, and we'll we'll dissect that as well. It's going to be like two weeks before some big revolution happens. True. It's going to be, John's going to get sick of us. It's going to be ridiculous. So where can people find you and follow you, John? Yeah, you can you can find me at, on Twitter at uh, JM Grange. Um, I do, I post a lot of stuff about um, different AI ML projects I'm working on. Um, so that's probably the best place to find me online. I might be uh, starting to post a little bit more on LinkedIn because uh, I haven't paid for a blue check, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much uh, how much my my uh, the stuff I'm posting is spreading. But uh, you can also find me John Grange at LinkedIn. And again, I'm I'm CTO and co-founder of Ops Compass. So if there's some other John Granges out there that uh, you want to make sure you get the right one, that's that's um, what I'm doing today. So, well, thanks for 
thanks for coming on again. And thanks to everyone who's been listening through the podcast. Like we've been saying, it's been growing. And if there's any subjects or things that you are interested in, let us know if there's any good value you're getting from the episodes as well. You know, we love the feedback and um, we've been trying to adjust and get better with every episode. So again, thanks to all the listeners. So, all right. I think we are wrapping up here. So 